The hardest problem with any company is when something doesn't work. What do you tell the people who are giving you money? Are you ready? All right, let's go. Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing. Your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. Before we launch into this week's episode, I'd like to take a moment to recognize someone who's been an inspiration to me. If you live in LA, you probably know Jonathan Gold was a groundbreaking food critic, and he lost his life to pancreatic cancer this week. I first met Jonathan about a decade ago, but I was a fan long before that. When we lived in Boston 15 years ago, I had his book, Counterintelligence, Where to Eat in the Real Los Angeles. And you might ask why I'd read a compilation of restaurant reviews in a city I didn't even live in. Well, he was funny and irreverent, and I lived vicariously through his explorations of ethnic restaurants around the city, which took me to faraway lands around the world. Jonathan's food reviews catalyzed a whole new foodie movement that flies in the face of overpriced and pretentious food. It helped reshape my own image of a Los Angeles that had evolved so much since the one I had left behind in the mid-80s. Jonathan, you, more than anyone in L.A., opened our eyes to the diverse wonders of our city through a common love of adventure and food. You'll be missed. This week, we're exploring a totally new direction, the life sciences. David Charlot's company, Charlot Biosciences, is developing a groundbreaking new way to look at how the body works. I met him at a conference where I was struck by how contrarian yet obvious his product seemed. Today, when researchers want to understand or diagnose disease, they usually have to kill and crush the cells to be able to peer inside them and analyze their DNA. Charlot is changing that with a new tool that allows scientists to sort and look at cells while they're still alive. I was curious to learn more about their technology and what it means for the future of diagnosing and treating disease. And while we're at it, he breaks down some of the common approaches we hear about today. Flow cytometry, gene sequencing, stem cell therapy, and the latest hot thing, CRISPR. He shares his lessons learned as an entrepreneur, which are transferable to a broad range of businesses. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. I don't think it's that big of an idea, but it's going to change the world nonetheless. It's keeping cells alive and studying them, learning everything you can about them to make better decisions. That's the big idea. So what kind of decisions are you making? Well, right now we make lots of decisions, life and death. As a matter of fact, we study cells to identify sickness in the world, new biomarkers, study plants and other types of things. So it's very important for us to really characterize uh, the tiniest subunit of life and understand it so that we can make better decisions. So, What's today's state of the art? Right now, we kind of kill them to study them, which is great if you can really study things well when they're not alive. When you're saying, so when you say we, that means the scientific community. Yes, the scientific community at large, the biomedical industry, that's a commonplace thing to do. We study DNA, RNA, proteins. Those are found inside of cells. So the only way that you can get to them is to open up the cell and therefore you destroy the cell to get access to it. So it's a catch-22 of you find out information that was inside of a cell, but you don't know how that information impacted that cell's life. And therefore, a larger tissue organism that may have multiple cells working together. Did you ever see that Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where the kid asks his father who always is messing with his head with these stupid answers he's like dad how do they figure out what the maximum load of a bridge is and then his dad's like you just keep driving bigger and bigger trucks on it until Until it it collapses (laughs) (laughs) so it sounds like it's the same thing it's like you got to kill the cell before you know what's going on that's exactly right there are ways that you can keep them alive and we're a part of that group that's really trying to keep pushing this type of techniques into the uh, community because otherwise you you have half the story. You know what was, but you don't know what will be. Cool. So tell us a little bit about how that actually works. Oh, so our technology? Yeah. Yeah. So it comes out of uh, Arizona State University, a professor's lab named Dr. Hayes. He and a couple of his graduate students a few years ago uh, identified a way to use complicated electric field theory to immobilize cells uh, based on their natural differences 
And what this means in a, a shorter language is we made a, a gradient sieve. So everybody uses a, a sieve. Sorry, that's I think how most people <laughs> pronounce it. I say sieve because that's what it looks like. But, you know, you cook with pasta. You got to get rid of the water. You grab your uh, strainer, also known as a sieve, and pasta stays, the water leaves. Well, what they made is an electronic version of that, but it's a gradient sieve where they're able to have different stopping points. And so if you have now different cells inside instead of pasta, the different cells will stop at different sieves, at capture points. Oh, yeah, it's just kind of like the, uh, I think the way they sort eggs is that they, as the, the eggs become larger and larger, it allows uh, the eggs of different sizes to go through. So you have like large, extra large jumbo. That's right. Something like that. But one of the most amazing things that a professor and his group discovered is they could identify the difference between MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aurus, versus, or staph, staphylococcus aurus, uh, versus MISA, methicillin susceptible staph aurus. Uh, They look the same, but they're different on the inside based off of a simple gene. That translates to you being resistant to uh, antibiotic treatment or susceptible to antibiotics. They look the same, so every other method available, they'll just capture and show, oh, yep, you've got Staph aureus, but you don't know which kind, the one that's resistant or not. In Dr. Hayes' technique, they actually trap in different locations while still being alive and intact. So we didn't have to destroy them or disrupt them to identify that they're different. And that's what's truly amazing about the technique. Hmm. And what you're doing is you're using, this is a tool that you're building. So Charlo Biosciences creates a tool. Is it for use in the clinic or and for diagnostics or is it only a tool for the research lab? Right now it's only a tool for the research lab. As we get further data and actually find good business cases for how we should deploy into the clinic, that's when we'll make the version of the instrument that can go through the FDA and be a diagnostic uh, platform. Okay. So explain a little bit about how these other approaches work. Uh, what, What would you say is your existing competition for the most part? Well, it depends on where we're going uh, in terms of application. But for basic cell analysis, where the cells remain alive, flow cytometry, you're able to label them using immunoassay labels. So this is where you put on some kind of a marker on the cell so that you can identify a difference. Uh, popular one is like CD34. Oh, okay, uh, okay. You can't can't use got, like really big words here and acronyms. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> just, just imagine cells have hair on them, looking for a particular piece of hair on the cell mm-hmm. uh, using an antibody label. So you can label one cell red because it has an antibody that you're targeting or green or purple. And uh, the flow cytometer, it uses laser light to... Uh, Excite, and if you see the color, then it traffics the cell to one place or another. That's mm-hmm. our current competition. It requires a labeling, though. An analogy I give about this process and why it alters cells mm-hmm. is if you go ahead and put ketchup or honey on your uh, sister or brother's hair and see how they like to hang out with you, they're not going to be the same as they were without the ketchup or honey on their hair. <laughs> My little sister, actually, Kathleen Charlot, when she was young, she actually did do this. She put some syrup in her hair, and there her hair went, you know, had to kind of cut it. Oh, my God. I, had, I did that with duct tape once. I'm so embarrassed to admit that, but it was horrible. That's right. But so <laughs> Never put duct tape in your that's hair. That's <laughs> right. Or, or honey. It's not going to come out very easily. But that actually changes the person, right? Your hair is now gone. In like manner, that's what happens to cells. Once you bind these uh, uh, things to them, they behave kind of differently. And so, which it works great and thankful that we have it. It's actually helped us make a lot of discoveries in the uh, about ourselves and other things like that. But we actually, by using these techniques, we we create what's known as perceived specificity because now you're looking for a known target that correlates with a phenomenon you want to see. And so if you don't see it, you also believe that you don't have the phenomenon, Mm. but that the marker may not actually be as specific as we think. So not seeing it may just mean that that specific marker isn't present. That doesn't mean that the phenomenon you're tracking isn't present. Mm. Uh, Classic cases, uh, cancer or other types of diseases where we have known markers that are specific, so when you don't see it, no cancer. That's usually what happens in the, with the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. That's what happens a when you false get... False negative. That's right. It's because you're not looking for the actual true marker because there aren't actually true markers for a lot of these different disease states. And that's why we're helping researchers first with our application uh, of the uh, technique. We brand it self is what we call it. Uh, the te- Yeah, the technique out of a Dr. Hayes' group. With it, we're able to identify new biomarkers that can actually help better understand the physical states of cells that can help us identify normal, diseased, abnormal, and things of this nature. 
What's the idea behind it and how does it actually work? What we use is a technique called photolithography, soft lithography to be more exact. This is like a microfluidics kind microfluidics of Microfluidics device, yes. It's okay. uh, super teeny tiny. Well, cells are super teeny tiny. They're on the order of 20 microns in effective diameter or smaller. And these uh, uh, pathogens that I just described, Staph aureus, they're on the order of 750 nanometers. Wow. So it's even much smaller than a micron. So to clarify then, you're creating kind of this very complicated plumbing out of is it silicon? Not silicon. Well, how are you building this? Yeah. So yeah. so the actual material that we're fabricating out of now, it's called PDMS, Okay. which is an acronym that I forget what it means. <laughs> There's siloxane in there somewhere, <laughs> but it's uh, it's essentially like a gelatin, cross-linked, super durable, e easy to use for rapid prototyping. Once we scale our manufacturing, we're going to use either glass or a thermal polymer like acrylic. Mm. And so, but once we're at the injection molding scale, we'll be able to fabricate our devices much cheaper and low cost so they can go everywhere because it'll be easy to manufacture. Mm -hmm. So you create this microfluidics device. Yes. And what does it actually do? I, I know the listeners can't see it. So that you get a better impression of it, I have oh, a little uh, cool. test case there. Uh, oh, nice example. Little demos. Yep. So essentially, we have our microfluidics uh, device. We have sample port and then a waste port you load the sample and then we put it into a larger instrument which we call the vision uh, our vision to uh, let people see things that they currently can't you put the sample in you run it in the instrument and then your cells will stop at the respective sieve gates oh i see kind of the very small i wish you wish i had a little microscope to look at this yep <laughs> yep but it's a very straightforward way that you can now identify differences in your cells that you may not have ever otherwise seen. Mm -hmm. And that's actually now a new data point that you have in your arsenal to better characterize the scene you're trying to characterize. So it looks like a flat piece of plastic, like Legos almost, has little... Um, reservoirs. Yeah, res they have little reservoirs yep. on, one, on, on both sides. Yep. And then in between them, you can see these tiny little groove-like things, some of these little channels that I presumably the, the liquid will go through and then somehow get... Now, let me guess. So you have a machine as well. So is this disposable? Do you sell these? We will be soon, yes. Nice. They, they are disposable. a razor blade model. Yep. yep yeah, yep, so yep. you get this recurring revenue from selling this device. Ah, oh, very smart. So how much is this piece of plastic? The, our self is consumable is for $450. It has 16 channels. So although the, the uh, piece of plastic itself, you say that's a lot of money for a piece of plastic, you're able to run 16 individual samples at the same time. We try to cater to people who have large throughput needs as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I'd love to get back to also kind of what your model is, business model and all that. But I want to take a little step back too. Is how did you come to the point where you could go to a professor in a lab and go, hey, I want to commercialize your technology. I'm your guy. What's oh, yeah. Your, what's uh, your, what oh, was your path? Tell oh, that, us a little bit that, about that. That's, that's a, a, a fun story, especially for aspiring entrepreneurs who have an idea on how to commercialize. Before you just go out and try to do it, get education and training so that you don't have a good idea but fall short. So I'll start with the beginning. I did my uh, undergraduate degree at Delaware State University in physics. I started out college, however, at Ithaca College in upstate New York, where I was, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. In high school, I was able to get A's in all the classes, so that didn't really help me pick my discipline. But the cold winter in Ithaca did help. Uh, <laughs> my first major was biology. And for whatever reason, they they put the biology classes and chemistry classes in the morning. And it, you know. Forget that. Oh, my freezing, God. Freezing, <laughs> freezing snow weather. You, I didn't even want to walk outside when I thought that school should have been shut down. So <laughs> I went to school in Boston after growing up in L.A. and it was so cold. That's right. Yeah, oh I can imagine. God. I can imagine. Well, I graduated high school in San Antonio, Texas. So the transition was too bleak. I said, I need to change majors to something where I can at least get to class. And turns out <laughs> business classes are in the afternoon. Ah. And so I was able to. Uh, so I switched to accounting. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> so you picked your major based on the time of day. I love it. Yeah, I I didn't always make the best logical decisions, <laughs> but I made good decisions nonetheless. Now, so uh, in my second, so you're an accountant doing microfluidics. <laughs> well, I am now, uh, Anna. But in my second year at Ithaca, I actually got a C in statistics, and my parents said. You're paying all this money to go to Ithaca College and you're getting C's. Just transfer home. So my parents, they both work at Delaware State University. They said, it'll be pretty much free for you to attend Dell State. So just transfer home. So I transferred. <laughs> and uh, 
I ran into a professor. Her name is uh, Dr. Helmy. She said there was this grant opportunity program called MARC, Minority Access to Research Careers. And she said, you know, if you study sciences and then ultimately get into the biomedical field, the government will sponsor you to go to get your PhD and have research opportunities in the summer. And I said, well, that sounds good because uh, I kind of like science and where I'm going to go visit, it's not going to be cold, I hope. So uh, that led me to a few places doing summer internships. And ultimately, I got accepted to do a PhD at UCSD, uh, University of California, San Diego. And that's where I learned a lot about live cell analysis because that's what I worked on. I made a uh, laser tweezer uh, uh, instrument where I was physically immobilizing cells with light. But I learned how you can use complicated engineering to answer otherwise impossible biological questions. Mm. And that's kind of what got me on this track. My actual lab that I got my, my degree in, the Jeff Price lab, we focused on studying a, a cardiomyocyte contractility. So your heart is made of cardiomyocytes. The reason it beats is because of the cell motion. Mm -hmm. And so we were studying drugs that had been recalled from the FDA using a technique where we stimulate the, the muscle cells to see how they respond in the presence of different drug compounds. Uh, that just got me on this path of thinking about, wow, studying cells is very important and studying them in context while they're alive under controlled conditions is also very important. Getting into now more focused application, that's what my PhD allowed me in biomedical engineering at UCSD. And then I had a, an opportunity to work with uh, one of my friends, Raj Krishnan. He had an idea in his PhD program and got a patent out of it and was able to ultimately, he and I, start a company. We won a business plan competition in 2009. For this company, a different company. A different company. The one before this, it's called Biological Dynamics. So I was CTO of that company for about six years. And I learned how to now take university research and actually convert it into a commercially viable product. So now back to your question of how was I able to go up to Dr. Hayes and say, hey, what do you think about me You know, being the quarterback and running with the ball? Yeah. He says, oh, you actually know how to do it. Would you like to run with the ball? Hmm. Uh, uh, because a lot of people don't necessarily understand advanced electric field theory as it applies to uh, microparticles in microfluids or in physiological fluids. And that just happens to be because of my walk, the PhD, my undergraduate degree in physics and working at biological dynamics, my specialty. So this is not just microfluidics, but also you're putting an electric field across it. And that's then right. it's impacting the way it's moving somehow. That's right. Hey, that's actually a bit of the secret sauce of why and how it works. Oh, shit. It's because, but it's fine. It, <laughs> he's already published the paper, yeah, so, yeah. It's, so you could read about it. But it's literally the fact that we have this electric field applied. We're able to, as I mentioned, the light is able to trap cells because of how it polarizes. The electric field is able to do the exact same thing. Because of this new cell phone technology and other types of uh, shrinking of transistors, we're now able to compact high-power uh, electronics in a way that makes it easy for us to polarize cells and immobilize them based on a hypothesis. Because at the end of the day, what drove this discovery was a, a question that Dr. Hayes and his team asked is, can we use this complicated electric field technique with microfluidics, trap two things that look exactly alike. And so we uh, now at Charlotte Biosciences call this the impossible identification. Right now, if you ask anybody, hey, how can you tell the difference between MRSA and MISA? The answer is easy. You grab the bacteria, you stick them in Petri dishes, you let them grow for a while. This usually takes about a day or two. You then, if you have MRSA, you'll know because you try to kill the bacteria. So you grab methicillin, and you put it on both, and if you see, oh, the bacteria is still alive, well, then you know that you have MRSA. <laughs> Meanwhile, the patient's dying. That's exactly right. So that's the current kind of gold standard way. <laughs> the amount of money and time that it takes to make this discovery doesn't make it amenable for certain uh, remote clinics or emergency care, ambulatory care. Now you can think about ways, and this is kind of where he was going with his team, thinking about ways to create rapid triaging techniques where you can say, oh, before we know anything about the patient, what they have, let's do the uh, the pathogen test. Oh, looks like he's got antimicrobial resistant bacteria inside of him. We know what to do. What has the reaction been from the scientific community to date? Because oh. this is a very different approach from what they're used to. Oh, so that's typically what happens when it's a different approach. In terms of commercialization, and this is also important for entrepreneurs, if you have a new technique, 
Don't try to flood the market and let everybody have it up front. Monetary uh, uh, pressures may make you just, you know, try to sell it like hotcakes. But if you have the ability, find key groups that you believe can help really prove the value of your platform to have advance it so that you can always grow the value of what you're working on as opposed to flooding the market have 50 people say they like it but have a thousand people say they don't because a new technique means that a lot of people aren't going to know how to use it very well it means a lot of complaints so who <laughs> yeah who are your key groups and how did you find them how did you determine who would be the right first customers got you well we're still looking to identify all of the key first groups but in terms of a uh, uh, how we found our current partners it's been uh, literally going to conferences and talking about kind of what we do so light advertising we've been going to actually a lot of investor conferences but meeting potential customers because everybody who's looking for money they seem to all band together say man this conference sucked there aren't any investors here they're all vendors who are trying to get services out of us and they say oh well what do you do what do you do and so i've been meeting a lot of different uh, companies that way that have applications that need new technology to service. And so at a conference in Santa Clara a few months ago, I ran into two companies that use CRISPR gene editing techniques to modify cells to make differences for either a drug or some type of a, a, a use case. This type of technique, it's being applied to yeast for literally changing the way beer and wine could taste because you change the yeast, you could change how they poop and that's their flavor profile. Hmm. Uh, interesting. <laughs> that, sounds, that makes it sound not so appealing anymore. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when you think of yeast, think of poop. And when you think of beer, think of poop. That's, 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 that's why that sell poop though. It's, uh, uh, you uh, ruined but, it. But, but nonetheless, they're using these techniques. And a part of what's interesting about what we're doing with our technology is the key buzzwords that we like to say is, Keep the cells alive. Don't add any bias for why you're separating the different types of populations. And it turns out for gene editing, people are editing cells. They need the cells to be alive. How do you know which cells will take the edit and which ones won't? So some cells, they're very good at being able to be modified. And some cells, they'll never be modified no matter what you do. If you have both of those groups together in one population and you just apply the edit globally without knowing that you have those two groups... When you're finished, you're going to think, all right, I have cells. I edited the cells. The cells were edited. You have to actually verify that the cells were edited. And so now people are using more costly sequencing mm -hmm. methods. So sequencing, got to blow up the cell to get the DNA inside of the cells. So you, you edit the living cell. You open up the cell that you edited. And then you look for a DNA change. So you keep driving the truck over and over again over the bridge until it collapses. That's, that's exactly right. I just knew that, hey, Dr. Hayes made a cool uh, a way to immobilize cells that are different without knowing a lot about them. And I understand that in order to commercialize technology, you have to make a robust product that's easy to use and go out and proselytize and tell people about it. So that's the approach I've been taking. I didn't actually come up with the physics behind the technique, hmm. but I understand how and why it works. And so talking to people, I'm able to bridge the science of what it is and how it works. But also I understand a little bit about biology to understand unique use cases and why alternative methods that exist uh, uh, would be insufficient or not truly ultimately why you should use it. So it sounds like a lot of listening. That's right. Yeah. How has the scientific community reacted to this? Oh, well, we're still getting started. The current reaction is, when can I have one? Yeah, because it's essentially a new uh, uh, supercharged bicycle that instead of having wheels, it's got like it's gravitationally hovering above the ground. So, oh my it, god, that's a weird analogy. <laughs> no, but so people yeah. know how to ride bikes, and so yeah. we're not making a new methodology completely. We already are used to sorting cells and analyzing cells, so we haven't created that approach. We can group cells and enable better classification while keeping them alive. You're listening to the Art of Manufacturing. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. We'll be right back after this break. I want to give a shout out to LegalZoom. They started out right here in LA with a belief it shouldn't be a frustrating or expensive experience to create a will, form a business, or apply for a trademark. So they started a movement to make legal help available to all. No confusing forms, no robots, just a straightforward online experience, transparent flat fee pricing, and the right people to help with all the details. In fact, 
This week's guest is a customer. I'm especially a fan because they're supporting Make It in LA and our local businesses. Participants in the Catalyst program will get a complimentary legal kit and access to their business legal plan for a year. Super generous. If you want to learn more about the company, visit makeitinla.org slash LegalZoom. LegalZoom, where life meets legal. We're back with David Charlot, the co-founder and CEO of Charlot Biosciences. How long has your company been around? Uh, October 2016 is when we incorporated. Got it. So how are you funded right now? We've been primarily funded by the founder's gracious gift to the company. I'm not going to say who the founder is because uh, uh, then it just sounds like I just gave a shameless plug for myself. <laughs> the company's name is Charlo Biosciences, and my name is David Charlo. <laughs> you're you're selling uh, naming rights to the company. <laughs> That's right. Because of proceeds from my uh, uh, savings from my first startup, I was able to save enough mm-hmm. money. And I live in California, so houses are expensive. So. My wife convinced me instead of us buying a house, we took our down payment money and we funded really? Charlo Biosciences. Yeah, so that's how we've been wow. uh, primarily funded. In uh, March of 2018, we actually got our first angel investment check. So we to date have used three hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, dollars towards the company. We have to spend actually because it's not all gone. The other piece of advice I would give to any person interested in starting a company: try to do more with less. Well, you're kind of saying that. I'm shocked because I've never heard of a life sciences company getting off the ground with so little money. How are you managing to do that? Oh, well, I've been uh, uh, utilizing a lot of free services that are made available, uh, incubators. So we were uh, housed at the UCI Incubator Wayfinder since April of 2017. All you have to do is apply. You go, you tell them your business idea. They are more than happy to take you. There are lots of incubators like that. They, they take equity? No. They don't. It's a UC, University of California program, so it's public paid for. Any non-dilutive source of uh, help and resources is definitely a good thing. That's right. And I'm currently now at UCLA's incubator, uh, Magnify. So another great resource. The reason for the move, there's a fabrication facilities and wet lab space at UCLA that are critical for operations. And just to give you a, a concept of how much we're saving by not going out and renting our own space and building it up to our needs. On the order of uh, $500,000 over two years wow. is what we're going to be saving by just being in this uh, publicly available incubator. Just have to apply. Magnify has a more stringent uh, uh, in-processing. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to speak before a committee and submit. But if your technology has the muster, all you have to do is go and present, and they're willing to help and work with you. Explain what wet lab space is, because a lot of people don't know what that Got is. You. So for biological testing, you need to actually have a space that allows you to work with biological uh, reagents, uh, chemicals, and cells in a safe way, so that if you have to dispose of them, you're not just dumping it down the sink or putting it into the ocean kind of deal. <laughs> so wet lab space, they have all those resources. And so at UCI, we were using just a general maker space, so we were able to prototype our device and now we're at the stage where we want to test on biological samples so what are you working on now what's the biggest challenges that you're working on oh right now it's a scale up for commercialization making sure the device is robust and easy to use and that it it works consistently on run-of-the-mill type of samples that our customers are going to want to use so what's actually involved in doing that scale up a lot of autocad for uh, a mechanical design and a lot of electrical cad for PCB prototyping. PCB. Yeah, printed, printed circuit, circuit board. board. Yeah. Okay. So the first phase that we're in now, it's now building five to 10 reproducible instruments that all work the same way. And then the next stage we're going to do is deploy it at a few research labs that we've already uh, connected with that are going to help us add all the application layer to it. We understand that how the tool has value and we want to show people Comparatively, this is what you could use. This is why you should use us. This is where we shine, and this is where we are uh, equivalent or we can't help you at all. What are you the most excited about in the future, whether it's specifically in your area or related? Just the uh, fact that we're now coming to new technologies just allowing us to understand the world around us better. So I'm really just excited about that in general. Mm -hmm. But in my particular discipline, better understanding of cells they're just going to really advance like generationally, you know, exponentially how we treat ourselves, how we live better. Do you see that actually being 
done right now? Is your product being used in a beta kind of scenario? One example of research that's being done on this platform that has high potential for the world is uh, stem cells, a cell that's in your body that can turn into any other type of cell. So people are thinking about how stem cells can be used as a therapy for treatment for healing. Another instance where it's commonly thought to be used is in the brain, healing neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or a, a traumatic brain injury. And so a professor and Dr. Hayes, they have an active collaboration where they're using this technology to actually track the fating of stem cells towards neurons and different types of neurons. Amazing. So you now have the ability to, with good quality control, predict outcomes for drugs, for change transitioning cells that ultimately go into a person's body. What was it like to work with the university intellectual property? Were you... That these were things that were patented by ASU. Yes. Um, and so you had to license the technology from ASU. Yes. You didn't have to find it because the Dr. Hayes found you. Is that right? Or you already knew him? Yes. So at least you didn't have to like orient yourself there. Yes. Oh, in terms of working with the tech transfer office, some are some are better than others, of course, depending on uh, what you want. So entrepreneur business, we want to kind of own most of the company, if you will. But some tech transfer groups, depending on the IP and the, the nature of your company, they're going to want equity in your company, and some may want 10%, some may want 50% kind of idea. It, it, it's a range. Uh, some groups may just want you to pay all fees up front, and so if you're a small company that doesn't have any money, it's kind of a DOA operation. You can't even begin. So ASU was actually great to work with uh, because they understood the state of the company and where we're going, and uh, I don't want to say they like me, but they understand I have good chances of being successful because of my past history of success. Mm. So that helped out. So that's another real thing that's important for entrepreneurs is build out your resume, have as diversified a background as possible and utilize it. Don't forget what you used to do. Like, <laughs> I used to sell women's shoes actually in college and understanding how to talk to people really helped out because I had to sell shoes. So I had to interact with people. It definitely. Uh, sometimes you get these transferable skills from things that you never thought would be that's relevant. Right. So what, what did you actually learn? Any particular like bad scenarios that you had to deal with <laughs> as a shoe salesman? I, well, the, the worst scenario I had was when the customer wanted the shoe and we didn't have the size. <laughs> what do you do? You have to try to convince them, come back later or order it through the catalog. That's a problem that has to be solved. So I actually learned practical problem solving in real time. Sometimes you have to go left to go right. <laughs> have you had any pivots in your company since you started it? Uh, no pivots really. Uh, the actual company, Charlotte Biosciences, what it's based on is taking complicated microfluidics techniques that exist in research labs and they use commonly, but they're not really available to the labs that didn't make them. So essentially, we're making a Swiss Army knife uh, mm. kind of platform where we can use magnetic fields to manipulate particles, electric fields, optical fields, and mechanical waves. That's what we're building. I wouldn't call it a pivot, but the company itself is based off of my starting IP uh, that I developed myself, but I'm not commercializing that IP first because Dr. Hayes' technique is more game ready for you know commercialization within like 90 days versus other patents that we have in our family that are going to take six months to a year to really mm. build out its value. So I don't call it a pivot, but I call it prioritization. Uh, sometimes people use the word pivot because uh, they think they've done something and it's not working, so they need to change. Some things take longer to come to fruition, and a lot of companies fail because they pivoted too soon and they pivoted for the wrong reasons. So mm. uh, if you're going to start a company and you understand that money is what needs to, it's needed to keep the lights on, prioritize how you can keep your lights on while maintaining the goal of the mission. So some people pivot because, oh, that's not making any money switch. And then five years from now, another company does the exact same idea and they're sold for a billion dollars. Do as much as possible with as little money. Because if you don't need a lot of money, then you don't need big investment from VC funds or things of this nature. And so you don't have the pressures of quickly selling or pivoting because that's usually what happens mm. is we want three years return on investment. Get out there and win. Well, presumably if you get venture capital or some other sources of capital, then you don't necessarily have to do the shorter term wins to keep the lights on, though, and that you could just pursue that bigger vision. So when you take that large capital, you usually give up a lot of your company. So your vision is now diluted with whoever owns you. 
<laughs> vision, right? That they want something for the company. And I'm, I haven't heard that many deals these days where the starting owners with the vision, they may own 70%, 60%, but that's not really enough to definitely navigate the waters. What was the name of the prior company you're at? Oh, Biological Dynamics. At Biological Dynamics. Was that a venture backed company? Angel investor backed, actually. Okay. So we had large network angel investors in uh, San Diego help us fund the company. It's a great idea. We're going to solve major challenges in cancer. I say we because I still have equity in the company. I'm, uh, I just resigned after uh, having a little baby boy. Uh, paternity to leave uh, took me out. That's wonderful. No, the uh, company's <laughs> doing great, but it's oncology diagnostics. So, yeah. how did that being angel funded impact the path of the company in a different way that? your company might be going on? Well, right now, since it's primarily only funded by myself, I don't have that many people to answer to. And the hardest problem with any company is when something doesn't work, what do you tell the people who are giving you money? Or actually, so Biological Dynamics, it was started in uh, March of 2008, and we really opened our doors in May hmm. of 2010. A company also came into the news and into the world around the same time. Uh, I won't mention their name, but they're called Theranos. <laughs> You know, great idea. And so when they got their large investment, did their massive press release, all of our investors came to us and said, hey, guys, they're claiming to do the same thing you guys are going to do, cure cancer. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait. We never said that we were going to cure cancer. We have a way to diagnose cancer faster and earlier so that doctors have better opportunities to treat. You have to really just appreciate you will be competing against others. And it's okay. Capitalism works. <laughs> Find your niche group that likes your product, support your customers, and maintain the values of your organization that show why you're going to be ultimately a value add. So paternity leave. How old are you? One kid or two? Oh, I have two. So my first son, he was born, and it sounds like I joke when I say paternity leave because most people say that doesn't make a lot of sense. How do you have a great job, a CTO of a company that's going well, and then you leave? We closed our Series C round of funding in June of 2015. My baby boy popped out in uh, August of 2015, only really one month later. My wife and I are the only two of our respective clans in California. My family is all on the East Coast. Her family is all in Ethiopia or Italy or Canada. So we really didn't have a lot of support out here. And a startup company is a baby itself. And so I had two babies to, to manage. You know, ultimately picked uh, my son and wife as the baby that I wanted to nurture uh, longer. Mm -hmm. And so transitioned out because of, uh, uh, well, I couldn't really commit to the time requirements for both companies. Because how do you do that when you're on paternity leave? Like, right. I mean, on paternity leave, they were calling me in to do stuff. And my wife's like, what are you doing? You're on paternity leave, David. I'm like, oh, okay. Talk it over with the team when I get back and then we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. But yeah, yeah. So but here you have, you have two young kids. You have a fledgling business. How do you balance being a father and uh, being an entrepreneur? Uh, I don't get a lot of sleep. <laughs> now, but actually I learned a great deal after uh, my first bout with paternity leave. So now my wife and I, we have a system. We work well together in terms of navigating the space. So she actually has a coffee business herself that she's working t towards growing. So Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so two entrepreneurs. She also convinced me to start Charlotte Biosciences as well. So this is really her baby. And every single time we get into heated debate about the direction of the company, she says, don't forget, I'm the one who convinced you to start this business. So you should definitely listen to me. Your ideas aren't always right. And I said, OK, honey, I'll listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> she, well, she's definitely part of the decision when you didn't end up buying a house instead invested in the company. That's right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Tell me about your 16 year old self. Oh, my 16-year-old self. Wow. What do you think of you today? Cool dude, man. Where were you growing up? San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Actually, I was tra leave I uh, I left Germany. I I went I started high school in Germany and then I finished in San Antonio, Texas. For those who probably didn't piece together yet, my father was in the military, United States Air Force, so military brat, I moved around a lot. So my 16-year-old self was thinking Dragon Ball Z is the greatest show on earth and I kind of like Ally McBeal, so one day I'm going to become a lawyer. <laughs> that's what I was thinking when I was 16 years old seriously that's right most people would not admit that their life is driven by media or television but yeah most I, people's I, are I'm sure I, 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 I'm okay admitting it oh that's cool on TV maybe I won't be like this person because that job they drive a nice car or it seems like they're adding value or having fun you know so I should have probably said I should become like uh, Carl Sagan or Neil DeGrasse Neil 
What DeGrasse Tyson. De DeGrasse Tyson, yeah, yeah. It's physicists that are doing cool things, right? Because I seem to have a mind for that, but TV drew me a different way, if you will. Yeah, so that's what my 16-year-old self would say is, cool, man. And he would be a little upset that he doesn't play video games as much as he used to. <laughs> you bounced around a lot, though, from city to city. Yeah, well, so I was born in a Homestead Air Force Base. Uh, didn't live there very long. Uh, moved to some part of Texas. Then we moved to Delaware. I think there was Oklahoma stint. We moved back to Texas and then Germany. So in the early 90s, that's when we moved to Germany. And that's kind of my formative years, if you will, were spent in uh, Stuttgart, Germany and San Antonio, Texas. So mm. uh, of all the places that I say that I'm from, I say one of those two places. What's the one piece of advice you wish you had known when you started your business or started being an entrepreneur that you think you'd like to share with everyone? That's a good one. For biological dynamics, I wish I would have known about California employment law better and also read a book on how to manage. Yeah, I made an assumption that the work ethic that I have, other people also will have. And you start hiring people and you're dealing with those conflicts. It's, uh, it's not fun. So if you want to start a company, you're going to be working with other people. Try to understand modern practices for organizational leadership and governance. So since you probably can't be very specific about <laughs> HR things, can you hypothetically say what kind of typical traps might someone have fallen into in your situation? Oh, well, in my particular case, I, I'm not going to give an example, but myself. So I mentioned that I know how to talk to people, but I'm also a scientist. That means that I have kind of a split brain when I interact. Sometimes I'm talking in generalities, and sometimes I'm talking with high specificity. If I'm interacting with you and you don't recognize which mode I'm in, then maybe you're going to think that I'm a crazy person or assume I'm in one mo one mode or the other. Also not understanding exactly the kind of command you have with your title. Uh, that's another thing. Don't fall in love with job titles and startups. I would say that at uh, uh, both companies, my real job title was uh, uh, get it done. Wherever that fits in, that's the job title that we all kind of have in startups. So uh, paying more attention to HR governance, after I learned that that's something that needs to be done, I voice of input for everybody who's involved. I literally forced every single employee under my uh, uh, management to present in our weekly and biweekly meetings what they do and how it is how it fits into the larger picture. So everybody is relevant. So microfluidics. One group fabricates, another group assembles, another group uses. The people who use, they always get the most glory because it's a, <laughs> I use this microfluidics device and I was able to identify MRSA versus MISA. Great challenge. But the person who glued the PDMS to a glass cover slip, which is painstaking and difficult and repetitious, no glory because they're just an assembler. So uh, I learned making sure that the assembler and all the work that they need to do is goes all the way up to and uh, shows the value that they provide for even enabling the experiment to be done to begin with so that it's not just the end user that ultimately gets – it's the whole team that's winning. That's kind of how you uh, – mm. well, that's how I try to navigate the space. I'm not saying I'm perfect because it's, uh, well, it's a whip, work in progress. But <laughs> People part is always harder than the tech part. <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> What's next? What's on the horizon? Well – Get the tool out, start uh, making sales, and then uh, ultimately we want to uh, help companies grow. So I would definitely love one day to even if I have the ability, so this is like the knock on wood wish. I see the biggest challenge in the industry for advancement is the, uh, uh, the business case for being a successful company and being a unicorn, uh, meaning you're not just a successful company, but you're you're going to have a large return on investment. That's clouding uh, um, general innovation in society. We could have flying cars already, but because there's no business case for it, we're still kind of stuck on good old-fashioned uh, petrol. The first cars that were actually made were electric, but the business case for converting uh, some r crude oil from the ground into gas uh, made more sense than uh, investing in battery technology because that's really the, the, what's crippling uh, electric cars still. Nobody's investing in those types of simple things. And so I would like to create some kind of venture that enables, don't bring me your business, just bring your science. We'll be able to build a business around it. So there's the clinical use, but also the industrial use for the technology. And what's the path? That's the, sometimes you got to go left to go right. Uh, <laughs> the good news about what we do, uh, I learned that I'm a technologist, a tool maker. I understand problems, but I may not be the right 
person to use the tool to solve the problem. So I'm staying in the make tools, voice of customer, rationale to modify, make it easier to use. So the path will lead to all of those destinations, as I mentioned, because we are a great service provider. We're like BMW. We make ultimate microfluidics machines. (laughs) (laughs) How can people reach you and learn more? So we have a website, www.cbio.io. So C-B-I-O dot I- I-O. I-O. Yep. And, and uh, check out our website and social media. We have um, yeah, we have Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, all C-Biosciences. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're working on some really inspiring things. Looks like you're just, just getting started really on the, the grand vision. And I appreciate the, the lessons in biology and the – actually, you don't call it biology – but bioengineering bioengineering and uh yeah thank you so much for coming in thanks for having us cheers it's hard to believe that it was only a hundred years ago that scientists mostly studied disease by looking at cadavers doctors didn't have tools like blood tests or imaging or molecular biology and other diagnostics to see what was going on inside a body when a person was living So our knowledge of anatomy and our ability to know what was going on when someone was sick was limited to a dead body. That seems incredibly primitive today, but that's exactly what we've been doing at the cellular level today. Being able to understand cells without killing them seems to have such obvious benefits. With my naive eyes, it seems this technology should be a game changer, and I look forward to seeing how this technology can scale. But Charlo's first customers are research labs, So it's not until they understand how cells behave differently in an electric field that we can then develop applications from that, and in many cases, pass FDA approval. But it seems like there are some very exciting applications on the horizon, like recognizing antibiotic-resistant staph, which is a huge issue. It's really exciting. The most notable takeaway from our conversation for me was his cautiousness. For example, he's so restrained about raising and spending money which is a breath of fresh air. But there's definitely a balance between diluting your interests with outside investors and having the capital to see a big vision come to fruition. His caution also extends to the company's path to market. He explained how he didn't want to flood the market before they were ready, which is definitely a counterintuitive point of view. But he's right. It can be good to keep the stakes low as you're still iterating on the product. And in the process, he's focusing on listening rather than selling. I liked his trade show story. Unlike the other vendors who are only focusing on pitching and raising money, he was meeting with potential customers and better understanding their needs. It could be hard to restrain yourself when you're an entrepreneur. But in the early days, if you focus on listening and learning, your prospective customers can help you build the product of their dreams if you let them. And finally, it was great to hear he had a good experience with ASU's tech transfer office. That's not always the case with universities. I know the president at ASU, and he's very pro-startup and pro-tech commercialization, but that doesn't always translate down to the nuts and bolts. I'm familiar with the topic of university tech transfer from hands-on experience at MIT and USC, and terms vary greatly by industry and by business model of the startup. But there are basic guidelines that universities usually follow. There's so much opportunity for tapping into innovation in universities. Maybe in a future episode, we can drill down more into that topic. Time to wrap it up for The Art of Manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we speak with Roni Kabat and Eric Mirandet from Tulip, a startup that's making it super easy and intuitive for any company, big or small, to digitize the factory floor. For show notes, visit www.artofmfg.com. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with your thoughts and ideas to feedback at artofmfg.com. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with Make It in LA and other partners. Visit makeitinla.org slash connect to sign up for local LA events and news. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, And remember, don't just make it, make it. <laughs>